Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Book Reviews. Today's guest is Jan Anderson. She's from Swindon and is a freelance writer, copywriter, author, editor, and artist. Jan also runs and owns several websites, including one of the UK's premier resources for older parents, mothersover40.com, and a website to support families affected by the loss of a loved one to suicide, childsuicide.org. So let me welcome to the studio, Jan. Hello. Hello, Jan. Uh, welcome uh, to you. Book Reviews. Um, can you tell me a little bit uh, about yourself? I was just given an intro, but can you tell me about your background as well? Yeah, I was raised in Worthing, Sussex with my brother. I've also lived in Stockholm, Sweden, the north of England. And since the late 80s, I've lived in Wiltshire. Okay. And uh, you're a multi-talented uh, lady, I, I can <laughs> see. Uh, but today you've come to talk about your book. Yes. Um, Chasing Death, Losing a Child to Suicide. Um, it's about your son uh, who took his own life um, back in 2009. Well, the book was published yes. in 2009. It's quite a sensitive uh, subject to write about. So can you tell me a little bit more about the book? Um, yes, it was an incredibly uh, sensitive topic. I mean, when my son passed away, uh, I didn't want him to have died in vain. Um, so. I believe that something positive has to emerge from every tragedy and for me I felt this insatiable desire to help other people, um, both families who've lost a loved one to suicide and young people suffering from depression. A lot of the grief recovery books that I read were remote and academic and didn't really connect mm. the brutal aftermath of losing a child to suicide. So therefore, Chasing Death, although it's not a grief recovery book as such, it attempts to connect to the raw grief of families. Okay, because I know suicide affects every community, every country in the world. Um, and because it's not talked about in some places, it doesn't mean that it's not actually you know, happening. And, uh, you know, it is um, a huge issue, particularly in the UK, where there's, uh, they're saying the Samaritans, there's 6,000 suicides a year. I mean, that, that, that's a huge number. It is a huge number. Um, and again, as you say, it, it's not spoken about. And I think because there's still this stigma attached to suicide, mm. a lot of people who are feeling depressed maybe are afraid to seek the help that they need. They're afraid to talk to people about how they're feeling, which is, is dreadfully sad. I mean, uh, last year in October, uh, a campaign was launched to highlight... Uh, male suicide under the age of 45. Um, and uh, I, I, I saw a quote actually, uh, you once said that I'm determined to be a victor uh, of circumstance, but not a victim. Exactly. So is that the reason why you decided to write that book to sort of, to, to show that? Um, not, not necessarily. Well, like I said, something positive mm. has to yes, emerge from yes. every tragedy, but I really felt, you know, that I had to make sense of such a senseless tragedy I yes, felt this desire yes. to help um, to help other people mm. um, I also saw it as an avenue to raising money for charity because one pound from every hard copy of the book goes towards Kidscape which is the UK charity dedicated to keeping children safe from bullying and abuse mm -hmm. now that, 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 that's you know it, it, interesting subject and I, and I think you're very brave to um, talk about that and I mean, how long did it take you to write? Uh, the it book? took six and a half years to complete, but oh, not, really not six and a half years to write, because obviously it was incredibly uh, difficult emotionally. Yes, yes. So I would go for weeks and months without writing a single word on the book. But because um, it's not just Christian's story, it's about the story of a wide range of families from diverse situations. Um, so obviously I had to spend a fair bit of time conducting research and finding families who would be willing to share their experiences in the book. I and also, um, I need to be able to write from the perspective of somebody who was several years along the grieving road, just to show that it is possible to move on with life whilst still mourning the loss of a child. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, in having said that, what, what kind of feedback have you had from people who've the read feedback your book. has been absolutely phenomenal. I've received wonderful emails from around the world, but also very heartbreaking emails. Um, and I've formed friendships with many amazing people um, purely through shared tragedy. And, and it's nice to be able to, you know, share your story with somebody else who's been in a similar situation. And, you know, I, I feel that perhaps that person also 
is happy to have found someone like you where they could you know share their experiences exactly so, because when something yes. like that happens to you you're sort of thrown into this wilderness of, sort of mm. relentless silent yes. grief and you have all these thoughts and emotions and you start to wonder whether you're the only person that's going through that and that's another reason I thought by sharing my experience it might you know give small comfort to other people yes, um, yes. knowing that they're not alone I mean that, that's good to know and I just want to sort of talk about the cover um, You've got a hand uh, amongst leaves. What's the meaning of that? Right. Well, when somebody takes their own life, they effectively die by their own hand. That, that's the significance. Oh. The hand, actually, is, is that of my eldest daughter, Annalise. The autumn leaves, um, they signify the end of one's current life, and it's the season in which my son passed away. I see. Uh, that, that, you know, that's, that's quite touching, and I think it, you know, for that cover to speak for itself in that way... Um, that you you chose it. So you decided that, I mean, how did that come to you, that particular image that you wanted to... Yeah. Well, bizarrely, I was yes. walking through um, a museum in Bristol um, and I suddenly saw this massive white hand painted on the floor and it was in that moment that like, the idea came to me. I thought, you know, that, that, that just symbolised um, suicide to me. So um, I went back home with that idea in my mind and then... Um, Design yeah, for cover. That, 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 that's that's great. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, moving on, um, who's your favourite author? And you, you do, do you do a lot of reading at all? Do you know I don't actually have a favourite author because there are so many amazing authors around. Um, there's one author I particularly like by the name of Shahida Rahman. Yeah. <laughs> I particularly thank you, Jen. enjoyed. <laughs> I particularly yeah. enjoyed her oh, novel, thank Lascar. You. Thank you. But um, I do tend to be a reader of non-fiction rather than fiction, and okay. I love anybody who can make me laugh. Um, I must admit that when I'm reading a book, it's rather difficult for me to take off my editorial hat and enjoy, enjoy what I'm reading I rather see. than analysing and trying Absolutely. to correct it. No, that, that's great. And has anyone inspired you through the years? Goodness. Um, so famous, I think people. anybody who dedicates their lives to helping others or anybody who battles against the odds to, mm -hmm. um, you know, pursue what they believe in inspires me. Um, Malala Yousafzai, for example, yes, yes. Um, well-known names, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. But I think the people who inspire me most are the everyday unsung heroes who never achieve public recognition, who are like nurses, doctors, teachers, um, caregivers. I think that's a wonderful response, actually, because you've not given one name. You've talked about a whole range of people, so I think that's absolutely wonderful. And uh, when you're not writing, what do you like to do? Oh, do I do I'm passionate about nature, and um, every weekend I go on long countryside walks with my partner. Um, I'm also passionate about art, so when I'm not up to my knees in mud in the countryside, I'm drawing and painting. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. And um, do you have... Uh, a advice for anyone wishing to write a book or even get published out there? Yeah, I think the most important piece of advice I would give is just to believe in yourself. Um, don't allow self-doubt to get in the way of your dreams. Don't listen to pessimists because they're often just projecting their own insecurities onto you. Um, in terms of a writing schedule, you just have to do what works for you. You know, you might read about some writers who sit down and write from nine until five, but that doesn't work for everybody. In terms of finding a publisher, um, you know, you have the choice between uh, self-publishing, print-on-demand, or mainstream publishing. Mm -hmm. I personally prefer print-on-demand because it's a much quicker route to market and you have greater control over your book. But obviously, yes. you know, you have to find what works for you. Mm -hmm. Print-on-demand uh, for the viewers is um, when you self-publish, you decide to publish yourself. So. Um, you know, thank you very much, Jan, for telling us about uh, your book. And you know, I do hope that you can find more sort of inspiration through you know other people's stories. And I suppose it's it's a healing process for you as well. It so. is. I mean, writing yes. the book, although very emotional, it, it was very cathartic. So, Jan, I'd like you to read an extract uh, of, of your book. So, would you please do that? Yes, certainly. This is from chapter eleven: memory triggers, sights, sounds, smells, and possessions. The loss of your child is not something that you experience just once. You constantly relive it, not only on anniversaries and other special occasions, but each time you encounter something that evokes a memory, a sight, a sound, a smell, or your child's possessions. These can be extremely powerful and can reduce you to a state of intense emotional turmoil. 
In the first week after Christian died, he began desperately searching for anything that he had ever created, touched or owned. His old school books, a picture of his handprints in a myriad of colours, his baby shoes and old Mother's Day cards. In August 2006, leading up to the fourth year since Christian's loss, we decided to clear out our attic. I was unaware of how many mementos of Christian's childhood there were nestling in the dark, dusty recesses an old pillowcase across which I'd painted Christian, Christmas 1987, and in which Santa left all of his presents. A pair of Dennis the Menace braces used to hold up his trousers when he had no waist to support them, and, once again, the clothes that he had been wearing on the final day and night of his life in 2002. I buried my face in the lacerated T-shirt that the medical emergency team had cut from him, hoping to smell just a trace of my living, breathing son, for the briefest of moments, I captured his scent and could feel his arms around me, but this was rapidly replaced by the damp, musty aroma that had impregnated the material over time. All that I could smell then was death, not life. Thank you, Jan. I think welcome. they're the very powerful words that you wrote there. So thank you for coming on today's show. Thank you. So I'd like to end the show uh, with a quote by Virginia Woolf. Uh, Every secret of a writer's soul Every experience of his life, every quality of his mind is written large in his works. So if you'd like to get in touch with me, please email me at bookreviews at lb24.tv. So thank you for watching. Uh, until next time, goodbye.